my big take home message after doing this work for 12 years is follow the money. Mm. Follow the money. So let's start redirecting financial flows away from fossil fuels and towards a more resilient and equitable future. Climate Emergency Forum. And today we have a special guest, Kathy Orlando, who's the director of uh, programs at uh, Citizens Climate International, and she's also a fellow Canadian. So we're going to talk all about what she's been up to with her work. I think there'll be a focus this program on how we educate the public on climate, how we get the message out to decision makers like politicians and policy people and how serious the climate crisis actually is. So welcome, Kathy. Well, nice to be here. Thanks for inviting me, Paul. It seems like just yesterday that we were at the conference in Glasgow. So why don't uh, I just let you, you chat a little bit about your work? The title of this session that we're having together is the transformation of the economy will not be linear. And that is based on something that I learned at COP26. I was in a session with economists and advisors, the finance ministers for climate. It's some sort of international group with 60 countries, including Canada, the United States, many European countries. And one of the economists said, the transformation of the economy will not be linear. And at that moment at the COP, which I found to be a very frustrating event, it was like the best of time and the worst of times, like you could right. just rode this roller coaster the roller whole time. Coaster. Yeah. Oh my goodness. At that moment, I had a, I just had an epiphany. It's like, yeah, it, it won't be. And this flat line or thing that is happening yeah. will mm -hmm. start to really accelerate once the, the policies that have been laid down that you could see being laid down at COP26 start to come into play. Yeah, I mean, the human brain tends to think in terms of linear fashion, you know, small increments, like with climate change too. And, you know, I like to call it abrupt climate change because, you know, the changes become more and more rapid, you know, almost exponential increase. And, uh, you know, it's like on a roller coaster, you know, that anticipation, you know, you're going up that hill and then you reach the top and then you go over the brink and things go out of, out of control. I mean, they speed up and, and uh, there's a big thrill there or excitement or things are just happening too fast. So, you know, I often talk about nonlinear feedbacks in the climate system and, you know, they make the system, you know, very nonlinear. There's many nonlinear systems in our, in our world. Like I always like to bring up the tipping canoe uh, example where, you know, you reach that point, if you're in a canoe, ever been in a canoe and you start to tip, you know, okay, you're going to be able to right yourself. And then you reach a point where the vibration sort of slows down and it's almost like it's, you're in slow motion and then suddenly you tip over and you're in a different state. And in nature, you know, any, the, the, the change from, from liquid to solid as water freezes, you know, very, very nonlinear because you reach a certain temperature where you're still water and then another millionth of a degree colder and you suddenly start getting the freezing. So there's so many things in nature that are nonlinear and there's, the, you know, it makes perfect sense that the, the economical changes will not be linear. They'll be highly nonlinear. So it's, it's, I agree completely. Yes, and I can see it in the work that we're doing. We at Citizens Climate International are in over 75 countries and we have people just building those bricks or laying down the foundation or whatever you want to say to create that transformation that is coming. So even it feels like nothing is advancing, but you can see... Um, how politicians are reaching out to our volunteers more, are listening to them who, 
flinging the doors open for you can you can sense that things are are changing um even in the work that we're doing there's a couple of excellent books on this sort of topic and one of them i think is called the idea of nudging if you find the points that are right for change in a in a complex system it can be a political system that can be the way countries are run um if you find that point that critical point where you just need a very very small push against it it's like finding a bridge and finding that one little stone that you could take out and then the whole bridge collapses right it's that type of thing so you're trying to nudge the system and Malcolm Gladwell has written a number of good books on it one of them specifically was was tipping point mm-hmm. and he talked about that that very thing you know if you can identify the points of that are ripe for change or the points of least resistance and you can get a sort of a lot of impact from a very small push. I mean not saying what we're doing is very small but you it's hard to find that point so you have to kind of push on the system in many places and then hope for you know a breakthrough. So so how do you um go about you know with the politicians from what I remember you try to be nonpartisan. I guess that's very difficult sometimes because it seems that one side seems to understand it what's going on with the climate uh, you know crisis and they say things about it yet they never um their action never never meets what they say and then the other another side kind of just ignores it and so so how do you it, it's hard it's, it's hard to stay nonpartisan i would think after 12 years of doing this and actually my work began when I was trained with Al Gore in 2008 in Montreal and I sat there and I watched him educate us for 20 hours. It was so intense. And he gave us all this information and I'm a scientist by training, not by career. So I'm a published scientist. I did all that and you know as an educator and a mom and a, and a very engaged citizen and I thought to myself my goodness how can somebody this well spoken with all this information not be able to get much done in the in the powers that he had and this this is me in 2008 and i'm like the politicians yeah. need our help there's something really rotten in the system that if somebody like al gore or stefan dion who had a brilliant idea way back in 2006 it that would have had us on track much better than we are right now um right. so i i don't blame the politicians i i do get really annoyed by some of them but i am yeah. nonpartisan i know of politicians who want to do the right thing um and there some of them like beg us to do more like they're actually begging us you've got to put our feet to the yeah. fire you've got to keep this going so um Yeah so I it, it yeah. is a truly nonpartisan issue and I don't blame most politicians I blame a few for being yeah. absolutely rotten players on this scene but most of them are just trapped in a system that is it's corrupt yeah. our democracy yeah. is hacked our social well, media is hacked yeah I, I, it's I mean yeah. when the corporations get too much power there's a lot of concern about twitter uh, musk what he will do especially you know especially if he gives Trump a voice again saying oh we need free speech and you know but anyway that's another story now i have to ask you is this uh, is this when you met Stuart Scott oh yeah about 6 months afterwards um al gore's organization climate reality put together a back end sort of social media site uh for all of us to connect and so there was this one site about urging mr gore to promote veganism and so then Stuart and I and a few other people were working on this letter together and if you know me you know I'm a little bit of a cheerleader you know like I'm always trying to be a little bit more positive because that's just yeah. my nature I think it keeps people up. but I'm just as you know I'm <laughs> prone to throwing myself on the ground screaming and crying at the same time I just don't show right. that to the world right so yeah. <laughs> anyways so I I I posted something and Stuart, it was so awesome. 
like ripped my head off for it. Like it was like, you're way too positive. And I'm like, oh damn, I love this man. I love this man. He's so <laughs> honest. Yeah. Like, I mean, like, and that was the beginning of a friendship, you know, that he could be so brutally honest with me. And I'm like, yeah, I agree. I know how bad it is, but it's just yeah. my coping mechanism to just be a little bit of a cheerleader. It's like, yeah. Right. Right. So yeah, so that, that goes back to to that uh, training. Yes, I I almost made it to the training um, last summer, but something came up. One thing I think on the political aspect is if there's a hundred groups lobbying a politician, say the minister of climate change or something, you know, then like ninety five of them will be from corporations with vested interests. The rest will be a trickle of non-governmental organizations or groups like yourself, it's very asymmetric. You know, it really changes politicians. I mean, we can look at Canada's, you know, environment minister now, and some of the things that are being done, or you'd think, oh, why would that person ever do that? Only when they get into this pos a position of power, like environment minister, climate minister, it changes a person, it seems. I don't think it would change you yeah. or I. Um, I, I think there's a lot of things that politicians have to do for legal reasons. Bill 69, but, you know, it just got shut down by the Alberta Supreme Court. They call it the anti-pipeline bill. Um, so basically it would require um, climate change to be considered in any sort of natural resources development project. Well, that got shut down by the, the Supreme Court of Alberta, and it's going to go to the Supreme Court of Canada. So I think there's a lot of legal reasons why our government can't do the things they do. They can get sued. They can get all, all sorts of things. So they have to proceed very carefully in the confederation that we are in in right. Canada. But my big take home message after doing this work for 12 years is follow the money. Mm. Follow the money. So let's start redirecting financial flows away from fossil fuels and towards a more resilient and equitable future. So how do we do that? Well, carbon pricing, like the one CCL advocated for and we have in Canada, incrementally rising price on um, carbon pollution, money goes back to the people, at least the, the consumer component of it, that reduces income inequality and is starting to you know, push the economy in the right direction. It needs a lot more regulation, a lot more tightening of it, but it is beginning to do that. There, there are other things. One of the things that needs to go with that is border carbon adjustments. The, the European Union is in alignment to have those um, in, in place starting in, in 2026. And Canada should be able to follow suit soon after. Even the United States is looking at border carbon adjustments because all their regulations that they enacted under Obama have like reduced the carbon within their industrial systems. So they have a very low carbon uh, comparative to other countries. Yes low carbon industrial system. So they're gonna to wanna to see benefits to their own country and to their own manufacturers. So there's uh, carbon pricing, border carbon adjustments. We could look at special drawing rights at the multilateral banks. So tie any sort of loan to climate change um, from, the, from the World Bank and the other multilateral banks that there are. Um, I thought, I don't know if you saw um, the, uh, Prime Minister of the Barbados uh, give her speech at COP26, um, but quantitative easing, there's been like $25 trillion of quantitative easing in the, since 2008 for the banks, for Brexit, and now for the COVID. Like if the we, pandemic. Those are, yep. those are just some of it. But one really interesting one, I think this is the powerful one that we really need to wrap our heads around. Um, there it was 100 and $30 trillion in private finance committed to net zero at COP26 in the Glasgow Finance Alliance for net zero. Now, they want to do it, but can they do it? So how can we make sure they can do it? Well, we can look to New Zealand. 
New Zealand is making it so that um, companies that uh, have to disclose climate risks, financial companies, and it's and now Senator Rosa Galvez has a similar bill introduced in the Senate. No financial penalties or anything, no carrots or sticks. It's just going to be you have to disclose your financial, your climate risks. Also, the regulator in the United States for like the stock exchange is also looking at something like that. So follow the money. We're talking $130 trillion. That's a lot of money. That's yeah. way more than the subsidies. And this will really start to transform the systems. So in conclusion, carbon pricing, border carbon adjustments, special drawing rights, or the acronym is SDRs, because do when you get in the lingo, okay. that's all they say is SDRs. SDRs. As, as well as, you know, quantitative easing is the ace up our sleeve. And um, and then looking at re regulating the financial institutions with their disclosing their climate risks. And of course, getting rid of fossil fuel subsidies and any yeah. sort of subsidy that's destroying it's, the planet, that should be a no brainer as well. Yeah. Now, do you have a quick uh, definition for quantitative easing? My favorite definition is filling a hole in the economy. All right, so it's we've we've got a giant hole that we've got. It's not just climate; it's biodiversity, it's soil, it's bio, it's phosphates, it's water, yes. it's right. everything. Right? It's those nine planetary boundaries that we are crossing yep. like crazy right now. So we have this giant environmental hole in our economy, and we can fill it with quantitative easing. So you know, my ideas that I've just listed. Um, come in part uh, from the brilliance of my executive director at Citizens Climate International and the work we do at the World Bank and the IMF and um, the Carbon Pricing Leadership Coalition, and as well as working with all of our volunteers. All of that has fed into this idea, but uh, as well, Kim Stanley Robinson's book, The Ministry of the Future, lays it all out. So yeah, quantitative easing is the ace up our sleeve. Um, once I read about that, I'm like, yeah, we can do this when, you know, things are going to shift. And there's so many wonderful things that can come out of this. Like, we should start paying, like, I'm part of the W7. I don't know if you're familiar with this lingo. I'm a woman's seven advisor to the G7 this year in Germany. So there was 50 of us chosen across the planet. And, you know, one of the things as a woman that I have to do a lot of is unpaid labor, like taking care of my grandmother and my mother as they were dying, right. as well as you know taking care of my children. And I have a daughter who's decided that she wants to be a PSW for a couple of years just to serve Canada. Um, and you know these are unpaid and low paid wages. Well, yeah. why not pay people better to do this? Why not? or it gives some sort of income supplement for people who are doing this. Because what is an economy? It's circulating money. And that would get money yes. circulating locally. And, and that's what you see in the Ministry of the Future. We just start paying people for doing work that they're doing. And one last thing in the um, Ministry of the Future that I just loved is no extreme wealth. Like, why right. does Elon Musk get to own yeah. the megaphone? Yeah, exactly. And, you know, the whole idea of ministry of the future is um, it's, 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 a, it's a hole in, in economics. Like we don't value the, the life of somebody, you know, like the, in the future, right? I mean, that's the whole idea of this ministry. It's for, you know, if you, care, if you don't care about the future, then what does it matter about climate change, right? Yes. One thing I thought that was interesting that you're working on is the idea that we worry maybe too much about CO2 and methane and not enough about some of the trace element gases that have extremely high global warming potentials, like 10,000 and 20,000 and stuff. Can you talk a little bit about those? First, acknowledging the big problem on the scene is the fossil fuels. There are 85% of the greenhouse gases. So um, for about two decades now, anesthesiologists have been trying to get a particular anesthetic that has a very high global warming potential. It's one year uh, global warming uh, potential is 8,000 times that of CO2, and it's called desflurane. So it's, it's a very, very potent um, greenhouse gas that, that gets released into the atmosphere. We're also trying to help people understand that when you put a price on pollution, that pollution can go away. 
it, it, it would be a very good um, a, a case study. So I'm, I'm going to um, share my screen if I may, and um, just show you what we've got here. So we've got this program, it's called Leave No Greenhouse Gas Behind. And so we have a narrow window of opportunity to avert climate catastrophe, and we must leave no greenhouse gas behind. We um, looked at anesthetic gases within the um, operating room. Um, so it's called the rule of fives. If the health sector was a country, it would be the fifth largest polluter on the planet for greenhouse gases. So they are about 5% of all greenhouse gases um, come from the health sector. And 5% of the pollutants within the health sector come from the operating room. And in countries that have clean grids like Canada, um, where, most, where most of our energy electricity is coming from non-CO2 sources, anesthetic gases are the primary source. And so there are two major anesthetic gases that are used um, in operating rooms that that are quite similar. One is called desflurane and one is called sevoflurane. And, but desflurane has a, a global warming potential at 100 years at about 24 times that of sevoflurane. Just for a comparison, if you were to look at a root uh, at sevoflurane, um, a, a typical uh, day in search of uh, putting one patient to sleep for one hour in the operating room, it would be the equivalent for sevoflurane driving 6.5 kilometers. For desflurane, it would be 320 kilometers, which is like, and they're very similar. And these are two other ones for comparison. There have been efforts to restrict it, but nothing has been done because the UN FCC does not include a health industry within their greenhouse gases because they don't want to regulate them because they don't want to break they don't want to break down the silos, but the, the World Federation of Anesthesiologists, the American Society of Anesthesiologists, and the Ontario Anesthesiologists all support restricting these high global warming potential anesthetic gases, which is called desflurane. Um, but also the, the NHS, the National Health System in the U United Kingdom, no longer carries desflurane because not only because of its environmental impact, because it's more expensive than sevoflurane. And, you know, despite efforts of anesthesiology prof uh, professionals, as well as citizens, um, we still have not been able to get it into the greenhouse gas inventory. And just for one hospital, when they removed desflurane from their formulary, they reduced their greenhouse gas footprint by 720 tons. So imagine hundreds of hospitals across Canada just getting rid of this one gas, and they also saved $45,000. Do they have a replacement for this gas? I hope it's not like giving the person a nail to chew no, on while no. it's being operated on, right? Like go back to the old you know, yeah. method of dealing with pain. Presumably yeah. they can replace it with something yeah. else. Yeah, with sevoflurane. Absolutely. Fluorine, right. Yeah. The, the yeah. Low one. So, yeah. Yeah. This is a, that's a really good question. So yeah. So desflurane can be replaced with sevoflurane easily. They're, they're very comparable, but look at the difference in the greenhouse gas, um, yeah. like the, the amount of GHGs that are emitted. And then, um, and Health Science North removed it. And if there was a price on it, I, I mean, sevoflurane, it would just add like $2 and 50 cents per bottle. But it would be over $44 per bottle of desflurane. And I think it's about $150 or something for, a for one of these bottles, right? So this right. would start uh, pricing it out. And so all we're asking on this project here is for um, the ministers of health and the ministers of environment um, need to work together to add all anesthetic gases to the greenhouse gas inventory and apply a price to it. So, and we have this website here where you can do that. So that's, that's one thing that we've done. And, it's, it's to show that pricing pollution can work because we've got to get used to that. Like there's all sorts of pollutants that we need to get rid of, not just CO2 um, yeah. as well. Uh, we hope it's a low hanging fruit that can build some cross party cooperation as well. Excellent initiative. Yeah, I mean, it's and people, you know, the medical community is, you know, acknowledging the risks from, from climate change more and more, not just physical um, health, but, uh, you know, mental, mental health and how 
you know, young people, um, a lot of them are struggling. Um, you know, and the pandemic isolated a lot of people. So there's that effect in, in the system, which we haven't really seen too much, you know, a, effect on, on the medical system yet. I wanted to ask you uh, two more things I don't want to forget. One of them is that you were in Ottawa recently, and uh, I missed you, uh, but you did a lot of interesting stuff on your trip here. And then the second thing is maybe you could tell us about the fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty because we have the nuclear non-proliferation work, you know, and the different treaties among nations uh, to reduce uh, nuclear weapons, et cetera. But there's also, there's a push now to say, well, fossil fuels are doing as much or more damage they're quite different mechanisms. One of them is an all or nothing, you know, the nuclear weapons are fired or they're not, you know, where we live under the threat, but fossil fuels are ongoing cumulative thing that has been going on and on and on and we have to stop it. So, so those two sort of things, let's talk about those a bit. Um, I'll start with the fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty. I think it's an amazing initiative Citizens Climate Lobby Canada and Citizens Climate International supports the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty. And it has layers to it. Ultimately, they're pushing for as a treaty to stop expanding fossil fuel infrastructure to wind down the infrastructure we have and peacefully transition to a green economy. It is that simple. Stop, unwind and transition peacefully. And so they're getting cities to sign on. Canada, so far, Montreal, Toronto, and Vancouver have done. And I know both Sudbury and Ottawa have initiatives going. Um, but I encourage every, everyone watching this to look at their own city and, and, and see if there's anybody who or any organizations who are working on it. Because four years ago, almost, in 2018, was the climate emergency declarations. And we all found out in about December of 2018 that all municipalities in Quebec had signed on to it. And no other municipality in Canada had done so. So that began this snowballing effect just to get, and then ultimately the, the federal government declared it as well. And so did some provincial governments, not Ontario. So I right. think that the fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty is really important for um, building that political will, but also calling out the fossil fuel industry. They're the problem. Yeah. That we have to name it and we have to name it again and again. Yeah, name it and uh, talk about it. And, you know, I mean, educating young people on, on all of this is very important too, because, you know, they're carrying the future with them, so. And, and ending on a positive note, if I may, yeah. Um, just to um, so we were on Parliament Hill. We had a conference, and to end it on the last day, um, we invited members of Parliament and uh, our volunteers to join us on Parli Parliament Hill to build a giant dream catcher, which is an, an Anishinaabe symbol, um, and it was giant. And I would just like to show some symbols because I believe at the end of the day that you know, all these numbers and all these stories that we have are really important, but also doing these meaningful activities together is something else we need to do. So imagine there's this one rope and it had to be all woven together. So here they are weaving it. Um, that's my daughter and uh, the help, helper, Greg. This is MP Laurel Collins. I mean, the joy in her heart holding that string for an hour with us as you can clearly see. There's Elizabeth May, same thing. She's in the circle, just totally enjoying what's going on. There's you know who. Um, this is our artist here, um, Will Morin. Uh, he's an indigenous artist and that's his member of parliament, Vivian Lapointe. There's Will with a dream catcher. That's what a small one looks like for reference. And there's Will finished holding the rope and all of us like bringing it up to eye level so you can see we're looking across at each other. It's about, it's about 25 feet across at least. And there's all of us holding it on Parliament Hill so you can get a, a perspective of, of what we have built together. So there were seven MPs um, and about 25 of us in total on the Hill. 
And also we invited the uh, Hill police to join us. And she just had so much joy um, when, um, when doing this with us as well, once she got the permission from her a supervisor to do so. So that's it. And I, I hope that leaves joy in your heart. And, you know, we brought some positive energy to Parliament Hill and these things are really important to, as well. The community building and the positive energy balances it out. Yes, well, it's, uh, it looks like a lot of fun for everybody involved, but it's also very meaningful. I mean, the dream catcher, you know, the history of it goes way, way back. You want to catch the good things and, and it's open. It lets the bad thing just pass right through it, right? That's right. And it's a Fibonacci sequence and it represents eternity. And he did, right. you know, all sorts of teachings with us that I think helped our settler minds get a little less decolonized. And we're on a journey and I'm really grateful for Will's teachings and for um, MP Mark Sade, who's also Indigenous, for um, hosting, co-hosting this with us. It was beautiful. Yes. Well, well, thank you very much. I'm very grateful that you were able to uh, share us uh, some of your work today. Um, and I'd just like to um, thank all of the uh, viewers of the uh, Climate Emergency Forum and I'd like to thank Charles and Heidi for spending so much time and effort in putting all of this together. And you know, if you enjoy this video, uh, please make sure that you share it on social media to people far and wide. And uh, thank you for, for your time as well. <laughs>